Uh, we had originally had uh, Wes Lambert on the schedule, uh, and we were pretty excited for that. He works with the Security Onion team up in Augusta on that project, and that's a great project. Um, at the last minute, we found out he wouldn't be able to join us today. So I asked a few buddies of mine to just get up here and talk a little bit about some of the different projects that are available similar to Security Onion, uh, stuff that we've worked in the past. Uh, so just as a, a quick shout out though, the reason Wes couldn't join us is that right now, basically as we speak, uh, he and his wife are expecting. So everybody can say congrats, Wes. Yes. Congrats. congrats. All right, we will send that uh, send him a nice little congrats for this. So I am Nicholas Carroll. Uh, I am currently on contract in bed with the Florida Department of State in election security. Joining me for today's panel is Joe McMichael over here in the corner. Uh, he works at Alpha 2 as the network and security team lead. And also bringing up the rear for the end of this thing is Kyle Kelly here, who is the senior systems administrator for the Insight Catastrophe Group. Wow, yeah, well stated. Thank you. <laughs> I read the program. Yeah. <laughs> I only had to proofread it like five times, right? All right, so uh, that's the intro for us. We're actually going to kick over, and Joe is going to lead in, and then I'll take over for a little bit, and we'll finish up with Kyle. So, Joe, why don't you come on up? I'll give you the clicker. Thank you. Um, I know there's a lot more brain power in here than I have here, so I apologize if this doesn't come across as intelligent as it should. Uh, I threw this together this week when I found out we needed to do something. Um, got two questions. Who's used Alien Vault before? A couple. Well, I know you have, because I set it up where you are. Uh, how about, um, what's the other one we're talking about? Greylog. Greylog server, I know you do, because I set it up there. No, no Greylog? Oh, you'll like one Greylog, you'll like Greylog. Okay, so we're going to talk about two things, uh, two seconds on my background. I know Nick spoke about it. I have a very eclectic background, a lot of compliance background. Uh, I have IT background from before. Most of everybody in this room was, uh, there's a couple people who might be near my age, but I got 40 years plus of IT background in various segments of IT. In the past X number of years, I've been doing security and networking. So that's a little bit about me. Um, we're going to speak about two things. First, we're going to speak about uh, a log a SIM, and then we're going to speak about a log server. Okay, any questions before we start? Nope. Which the one on the top? Uh, push that one. I think it's that one for the proceed. Oh, okay. It is. Okay, good. Alien Vault. Alien Vault, there's two flavors to it, and I'll talk about what the differences are in a minute. The first thing is, does anybody know what an OSIM is before, I, before they read that? Okay, anybody know what a SIM is before we read it? I got a couple people know what a SIM is. Okay. So, OSIM is Alien Vault's free product. There's an open source product for Alien Vault, and um, you can download it directly from their site. I will have where you can download it. Uh, SIM is a um, event collector, and basically what you do with Alien Vault is you're going to send it logs from all your different devices. And it, this product basically has a framework that, I, and I think I heard somebody speak in the other room about this morning. There's a framework that is set up underneath of it with a whole bunch of other open source products. And basically Alien Vault took these open source products, which I'll, I'll show you what they are, and they put a front end to it. And they put some code, they wrapped some code around it. And it's a pretty good product. It works pretty well. And the, sh the free version of it, if, who works in a corporate environment here? Everybody work in a corporate, mostly? Um, it's, it's something that you can stick up in, in, in a corporate environment, the shareware open source version is. Um, when you want to start getting into the deeper pieces of it, you'll want to get the licensed version. But it allows you to collect logs from your, uh, net, all your network devices, so switches, routers, firewalls uh, can all send um, logs to it. You can then turn on some analytical engines and you can take a look at what's coming from those and who knows what correlation is? Yeah. Yep, we got some people know what correlation is. That a correlation basically takes information that's coming in from all these different logs, and it will decide if there is possibly something going on on your network that shouldn't be. 
So if somebody is trying to traverse through your network, or somebody's trying to hack into a device, or maybe somebody is running something on your network that they shouldn't be, uh, somebody's running a tour, and not supposed to be having a tour in the corporate environment, it will recognize this and it'll set up alerts. Okay? It, it does um, require a host. There is a, um, it needs a uh, box to run on by itself. So when you install this, it installs on bare metal, but it'll also run as a, in a virtual environment. In fact, you can download an, uh, an environment, uh, yeah, you can download the ISO directly from them. Anybody wants to take a snapshot of that? That's where you get it. Are you going to show your deck after? All the, uh, as long as everything works as planned, all of the re uh, speaking events will be recorded and posted to YouTube or not. Okay. Okay. Um, there's a lot of information on it on their website too. Uh, there is, there's a lot of help. There's a lot of YouTube videos that you can get. So if it's, if you guys have never stood up a sim before and you want to find out oh, what's it like, you can set it up in your lab, you can set it up in your environment. It's pretty easy to do. If I can do it, anybody can. Yes, sir. Is there any benefit to um, using the licensed product for more critical systems and then maybe using the open source for less critical? There is, and I'm going to speak about what that is because that's a good question because there are some big differences. Um, okay, this is, this is, what's the picture of? It's just the general dashboard. Oh, okay. It's the general dashboard. These are the products that come in it, okay? All these products basically are all open source products. You can download every single one of them, and there's more that are on here. Um, and so who recognizes some of them? Okay, so you've seen a lot of these before. Um, basically, who knows what F, F probe does? What's F probe do? Anybody? F, F probe takes a look at the traffic, okay, and we'll do some analytics on it. How about Nagios? Network monitoring. What is it? Network monitoring. Right. It will monitor. It'll monitor items that are on your network. So if you have a server, um, a switch, whatever, you want to make sure that it's still on and active. That device, if you don't have that in your lab and you don't have a, a, um, something stood up like that to keep track of, is everything up? Is there traffic coming from it? How are the interfaces working? That's a great product, open source freebie. Uh, NF dump, who's used NF dump? That basically does a NetFlow uh, dump. Anybody turn NetFlow on yeah. on a network device? Yeah. Okay, this will dump that. Open Vaz, everybody's probably heard of Open Vaz. OpenVAS is a big part of this program, and um, when you actually get into some of the analytics and some of the dashboards, you'll see a lot of information that basically behind the scenes, it's running OpenVAS. If you have never used OpenVAS, and um, you don't have a product that will do vulnerability, this is a vulnerability scanner, if anybody knows. Um, anybody here, Nessus? Yeah. It's a freebie version of Nessus. Uh, great product. We have we have used it in the past. So have we. Uh, OSEC. Anybody know what that one is? This was basically built on OSEC. Okay, and this is this is a, a um, security tool. Uh, what is Prads again? Who knows what Prads is? I don't remember what that one is. So you have my definitions on here. Uh, I think I put it in notes somewhere. I don't okay. Uh, Suprata or Snort. Same thing as Snort, who's heard of Snort, it's a product, okay? Both open source products, behind the scenes, this thing's basically doing the analytics that Suprata or Snort would do. So there's all those rules that we would download. Is everybody familiar with the, the rules? Yeah. Right. Same thing, TCP track does exactly that, tracking TCP packets. Um, and then they took a whole bunch of custom code, uh, and I'm sorry if I'm in your way, they took a whole bunch of custom code and they put this front end on it. The, uh, actually, this front end is from the real Alien Vault. Because I can see their, their logo is different for the real Alien Vault. So, their tool will then uh, do correlations it, and it basically takes all these rules and it says, for example, there is a, there's somebody that got into the network with an admin account. Okay, so where does an admin account get logged when you're logging into a switch or a router? It will send 
a message to this, a syslog gets sent to this, and it says, okay, an admin logged in. No big deal. If it's everyday event, not a big deal. Well, then an admin logged into another device and another device and another device and another device and another device. Now what's going on? Somebody's traversing through your network. And it'll, it'll time things. It'll take a look at the time that things are going on. And it'll send up a warning and say, hey, there's somebody that's, that might be traversing your network as an admin. Or somebody goes in your, into your network as an admin and the password changed. And then they logged into another one and a password changed. They logged into another one and a password changed. You can set up triggers and alerts for that. Okay, Very cool tool. Alien Vault's a cool tool. You'll like it. Um, what's different? This, so who asked that question? What's different between the paid and non-paid? This gentleman. Okay, some of the differences. In the paid version, you get access to every single one of the logs that it stores. So any, any log that you can think of on any device that's attached to your network, you can send to this. So if you have a UPS, you can send to it. If you have all your servers, you can send your server logs to it. You can send your um, network device logs if you have an air conditioner that's attached to your network. You can send the logs from your air conditioner. You don't have the full access. Is that me pushing that? No. Nope. Was that a yes or a no? No. Oh, okay. Um, you, you do not have access to the deep level of all the logs. We're going to talk about gray log in a second. Uh, so that's one of the differences. You can't query the actual le um, deep level of the logs. Um, there is no cloud version of it on the um, shareware open source version. So um, on the uh, paid version, you can, you can have a cloud instance of it. And you can take a look at multiple um, instances of it. Uh, the full correlation, and this is the, probably the thing that's the uh, most expensive piece of it, the correlation rules that I'm speaking of that says, you know, the example I gave, you see something that's going from one piece of hardware in your network to another to another and traversing through the network. You have to set up a rule within the, the tool that says, okay, if you see this occurring and it's within X number of seconds, then set up and send up an alert. Those you have to do manually. There's about... 40 or 50 of them that come with the freebie version okay. that shows you how to set them up. When you get the paid version, there's thousands and thousands and thousands of them, okay? So they have guys and, and gals that are sitting some desks someplace saying, okay, well, how do I figure out if, if this is gonna be something that's vulnerable on somebody's network and they write the correlation rules for it. And that's basically the subscription that you're paying for, okay? And there's a lot to that, you know, if you think about it, how do you figure out if there's somebody that's running a BitTorrent on my network, you know, and they downloaded this, this type of file and they then logged into this device, you know, is, should I set up an alert? Well, you have to, it's like a programming type thing. So those rules don't come with the freebie version. But a lot of it you can do. Yes, sir? What's the uh, licensing structure? Uh, it gets pretty pricey for the real version. Um, you probably can't get into it for less than 20 grand. My guess. So, I mean, is it uh, per uh, device going to log? It is per gigabyte, I believe, of information that you gather. And if you have different segments outside of your um, main location, for example, if you have a bunch of branch offices, you're going to want to set up a sensor in each one of those branch offices, and they get you for X number of dollars for those, which, you, again, you can set up with a free version. Um, and then they get you for the number of CPUs, I think, that you're allowed to run it on. There's like, I think, they, I don't remember. But we did get, we did not run, one of the shops I've been in, we ran the expensive version. And I think it was 80 grand or something earlier. And one of the shops that I set it up, they're still, as far as I know, running the free version. And have somebody that's monitoring it or they're licensing seeing it through them. I don't remember. Um, the, the other thing you don't get is data visu visualization. So there's a lot of reports that come with it, with the paid version. There aren't a lot of reports that come with a free one. In fact, if you click on reports, if I remember in the free version, there's like five or 10 reports. In the paid version, there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of reports. And um, support. In the free version, you guess how much support you get. 
to the big goose egg. Um, however, you know, like I, I'll tell everybody that I meet and everybody that's done networking and cyber stuff, Google's a great tool. There's a lot of information out there. There's a YouTube you can look at. Uh, and like I said, if I can set the thing up, you guys can all set it up. Um, any questions on Alien Vault? Does everybody, I mean, I went fast. I know I went fast and it's just a brief, this is basically something you can look at. But does everybody understand kind of what it is? <laughs> okay. It is a cool tool to look at. Even if you go out and take a look at, you, at YouTube and, and say, oh, yeah, this is something we could or couldn't use in our shop. <clears throat> gray log. Okay, gray log is, if you don't have gray log in your shop, you should have gray log in your shop. I'll just tell you. Um, it is a uh, server that you set up. It's very easy to set up. In fact, I believe there's an OBA that you can download and just run it as a VM. Now, I probably wouldn't do that in, in a production shop because it's probably not tweaked for security that it should be. But I think you can download the OBM and bring it up and it just starts running. The biggest issue I've run into with trying to migrate the OBA uh, into production. Uh, oh, yeah, I don't do that. <laughs> it's, uh, I've made that mistake. <laughs> um, is that the uh, drive will fill up very quickly because it's set with a, just a small 20 gig drive. And when we talk about logging tools, capacity goes through the roof very quickly. Uh, and it didn't want to take the configuration changes to actually expand out the drive easily. So I wound up just taking it down and reinstalling it correctly. Right. And that's one thing you should understand. How, how, how many people have sent logs from one of their, let's say a firewall, to a log server? OK. How many logs get generated from a firewall? You cry. Yeah. Oh my <laughs> heavens. And I'm telling you, millions and millions. You will get millions of transactions coming from this thing, especially if you have a busy shop. Yep. OK. So now you add in the fact that you have three locations and you have three firewalls, and you got three firewalls going to a log server, and you would say, okay, I want, I want all my router logs too. So now you're sending all your router logs, okay? And you may not be, does everybody understand different levels within syslogs? There's information, okay? There's different levels of information that uh, the systems will send out to a log server. And I'll, talk, I'll tell you what a log server is. But they go all the way from, I think there's a debug, which I, I really don't use. So that'll send everything under the sun. You wouldn't want to log everything forever. But then it's information, okay? All the way up to critical and some numbers in between. If you send all of the information, which you might want to do for your firewall, because it's going to send everything, there are millions of records. <coughs> if you just send, hey, critical logs, then you know everything, in my opinion, everything critical you need to take a look at. Okay, so you might be getting a lot of things, but it doesn't fill up the disk as quickly as what he was saying if you're sending all the information. So let's talk about what it is. First of all, let me talk about what Graylog is. Um, it's, this one's open source. This is a freebie. I think there is a paid version of it, but I'm not sure. It's probably somebody trying to help you set it up. And I think my last slide tells you the differences, but it's not a big deal. Everybody should take a look at This is a cool product. Everybody should take a look at it. Um, there are all kinds of dashboards on it. There are all kinds of reports you will be absolutely amazed at how quickly it does a search. So, when the, in a search window, did you print out any s screens or just the ones I provided? Uh, if you kick over, dude, there's where to get it. I'll tell, you, I'll tell you the search in a second because I don't want to get ahead. Uh, this does require Linux. This one doesn't run on Windows. Okay, so it requires some kind of Linux sys um, um, install. So if you got it, no, but if you don't have anybody in your shop that knows Linux, this is one that requires it, sorry. Um, this is where you get it. And again, if the slide decks are available, you don't need to worry about it. Uh, you can get it in so many different flavors. You can get it in Docker. You can get it in uh, as an ISO. Uh, there's different, you can get uh, different versions of Linux that you can download. You can download an OVA and put it in a VM. It'll run in... Um, uh, any, v, any of the VMs it'll run in, okay? Cool tool, if you, like, like Nick said, if you do download the OVA and run it in a VM to test it, don't migrate that to production. You'll wanna do a fresh install on this one because you wanna beef up your security and you will fill up the drive. 
Okay, because the default, I think, like Nick said, is 20. Yeah, it's like 20 gigs. 20 it's gigs, you'll fill it up fast. Okay, this is one of those where you ask the question, how many terabytes do you need? Okay, uh, I just set one of these up with 12 terabytes, and I'm not sure how quickly we're going to fill that up. Um, use cages. This is where you can start sending logs from. Anything that you can think of that's on your network, you can send a log to it. Uh, it'll do uh, IT, IoT things, anything, literally, that's on your network that will send a log. This can interpret it. Now, out of the box, it comes with interpretations for normal syslogs that you would see. Cisco devices, anything that you can think are like, you know, everybody and their grandmother knows what they are. Um, but when it gets to the point where you're sending a syslog from something that you homegrown, but it's on your network and you want to send logs to it, you can do JSON scripts and parse the logs and put them in different categories within the database. It is slick. Uh, and again, if I can write JSON code for it to do this, you guys can all do it. Um, it will do alerts on anything that you can think of. So for example, if you have a device that you're not using Nagios, you, you have a device that you want to say, is this thing up? Because it's supposed to be sending me syslogs all the time. Well, you can set up an alert that says, if I haven't seen a syslog for five minutes, then send me an email, send me a text message, uh, put up some kind of alert. And then it'll, you can set, have resets go. So if there's all kinds, anything you can think of with an alarm, you can, you can alarm on it. Uh, you can do automated reports. You, uh, you can do compliance reports. So if there's something that you want to see that all the uh, syslogs are coming in from certain devices, who's got HIPAA compliance issues? Anybody got HIPAA compliance issues? This may satisfy some of your HIPAA compliance things. Are you mm -hmm. capturing your logs? Are you storing them for, what is it, 12 months? Uh, who's got um, FDLE requirements? Uh, there are some FDLE requirements. Yeah, I forget how many months you have to store it. Probably FDLE, you probably have to store it for 25 years. No, I don't, I don't know, but um, you're supposed to be storing your logs. You can also, with this product, as logs come into it, and again, you can send logs from thousands of devices, and this will grow. This can grow exponentially, because you can have full clusters of them running. Um, you can capture logs from different types of devices and put them into separate indexes within it. So, for example, if you want to capture all your Cisco devices and put them in a separate, it's like a database, in indexes, then you can do that. If you want to capture all your Windows servers and see, okay, well, it, you know, when logs go back and forth, they tell you a lot of things. So, are you got a 2003 server running on your network that you don't want to hear about? You can capture a log, set up an alert. Hey, somebody attached a 2003 to my network. Um, the alerts are crazy. You wouldn't believe how many alerts you can set up. Uh, browser traffic analysis, you can, this is just one of the things that I had to do in, the, in a past life. Somebody that was working on the website of, in the development area wanted, wanted to know, you know, when everybody goes into our website, well, what, what browsers are they using? Because I'm trying to develop for IE and I'm trying to develop for Chrome and, and Firefox and all that and I, I want to know what's everybody using and what versions do they have. You can scan all the logs that are coming from your web server and pull out what browser they're using and spit out a report to them. Okay. Um, the last thing I want to tell you about this, I think, there are the limitations. The last thing I want to tell you about it is there is um, a search engine right here. You just start typing in queries, and it has its own goofy little query language. It's kind of SQL-ish. You will not believe how fast the thing is. It is awesome fast. So here's some, here's some of the logs. Uh, these are fields within that record. Okay, it does a full histogram of whatever your whatever is currently in your query. You can query by time period, um, by keywords, by a field. Okay. Yes, sir. Um, does this have a way to prioritize what you want to be searchable and fast versus maybe something you want to compress? And you store? can. Okay. Yeah, with the index structure, you can do that. Okay. And you can also say, 
for indexes. So for example, I, I was saying you might want to, firewalls give out so much information, okay? Right. So you might want to take your firewall logs that are coming in and everything that's informational and throw it into one index, okay, and store that for 30 days, okay? And everything else from your firewall you can store in a separate index and you can store that for 30 days but tell it that you want to store 12 copies of that 30 days. So then you have it for a year. And then you can tell that, once I hit that threshold, do I want to overlay the old one? You know, and you can tell it, what do you want to do with the old indexes? So, super fast, you won't believe how fast the thing is, because I've been at places that stores a lot of information in it. Um, you do have some limits with the free one. Uh, you know what, it says five gig a day, but I've put way more than five gig, gig a day in these freebies. But their website says five gig a day. I've, I've never seen that happen to me because I'm telling you, I've done 20, 30, 50 gig in a day. Um, it doesn't, this one, again, doesn't come with any predefined reports. Um, most of the, I, I've never seen the paid version of this, so I can't tell you what those predefined reports are, but my guess is when you're going and you're setting it up, you're going to know what you want anyhow. The reports are not hard to write. You're basically saying, you know, this is your query line up here. What do you want on the report? Do you want the histogram on it? Do you want the details on it? What do you want on the report? And then you just say, I'm going to see that every day. Okay? And again, support. You guess how much support you get? The big goose egg, you get the big goose egg. However, like I said, Google's your friend. There's a lot of information out there on Graylog. There's a lot of YouTubes on it. Um, there's, a, there's a YouTube that I used. I probably set this up for the first time about five years ago. And I just followed some, some guy that was kind of like me, and line by line, he said, do this, do this, do this, do this, and you know what? In an hour, I had the thing up and running. So again, if I can do it, you guys can do it. Okay. All right. I took more than 10 minutes. I apologize. Oh, uh, that's very Any good. questions? If you do, I'm around all day. Yeah. Thank you. Joe's volunteering mostly over by the uh, cyber range, so you can go pick his brain whenever you feel like it. Uh, I'm going to pick up with the next one here with Security Onion. Uh, Security Onion was, again, uh, what uh, Wes's team puts out. This is a great open source product that you can pick up and use, especially if you're interested in threat hunting or doing a lot of data analytics in your shop. Okay? So well, if you think about like uh, OSSIM or Graylog, those are excellent you know, set and forget tools or build me these kinds of alerts tools. Security Onion takes that just one step further and it allows you to carve out that data and interact with it much more easily uh, when you set it up. So uh, it's, it's very similar to uh, the idea of OSIM where it's basically a bunch of different open source tools that have just been put together with, you know, some special sauce code to make their own little distribution, but it works great. Uh, you do need to install it on some sort of host, right? It will need a bare metal host or a VM, whatever you'd like to run it in. Uh, and when it comes down to a lot of these tools where we're dealing with logging and analytics, anytime you can feed it more horsepower, that's better for it. Always, always more horsepower. These things are hungry. So you can go get the ISO. Uh, Security Onion actually hosts their ISO through GitHub. Uh, instead of just off their own download page. They're, they're a very connected community uh, kind of shop. They really like staying with that open source feel and really being a part of the community. They actually, um, you know, they're in Augusta, which is like, what, five hours north of here, I think? They have their own security conference <laughs> that is just security on the conference. And you can go up for the day, uh, and it's fairly inexpensive. And you can actually go up and hang out with them and they will teach you all kinds of stuff about this thing. That's a good thing to think about doing, especially if you want to get into this threat hunting side of thing or this data analytics side of thing. Uh, I want to say it's in October normally. Yes, yeah, the day before B sides Augusta, so yeah. I have to go up for a whole weekend and pick up two conferences for a while. Yeah, it's great. And you said it was Security Onion. What was the name of the conference again? It's, it's Security Onion Conference. Okay, is it? Yeah. It's, it's SOC Augusta, Security okay. Young Conference Augusta. If, if you just look for it, you'll find it. 
So again, like I said, it's, it's very similar to OSIM. Uh, we see a lot of these tools over here that were in OSIM as well, right? So Snort, Suricata, doing our network uh, analysis and alerts. Uh, Bro for carving out some of that information and doing some more alerting. Uh, was on Squirt, Cyberchief, Nminer. A lot of that stuff was already in tools we've talked about. The biggest difference here is, is that this one really puts on display the fact that it has ELK inside of it, okay? So most of these systems are built on or are using some variation of ELK, the Elasticsearch, Logstash, Kibana kind of build of server. They put it front and center. Like when you go in, you get the Kibana dashboard. You don't get the Sitkin dashboard with something special on it. No, no, you're just in Kibana doing Kibana things, okay? They really harp on and make that like a, a primary focus, which is great because Elk is very easy to understand for these kinds of searches. It runs very well, and there's a ton of support for it. So anywhere you go out and you kind of want to learn it, you know, you can just Google Elk, and someone will have a tutorial for you. So and they're there, uh, doing a little bit of data on there. Uh, you can feed it just about anything, similar to OSIM and Greylog, because it's running a lot of the same open source tools, right? any kind of host transaction logs, network data, net flow. If you want to take full packet captures and feed it into this thing and then carve them up, go right ahead. It's all about it. The biggest limitation is support. Um, they do, because they are all technically also a company, even though they are open source focused. You know, if you want professional support, you have to pay for it because they have to eat somehow. Yep. So, um, but it's, also well worth connecting with them on that and doing that uh, you know, training and everything like that. They'll also uh, sell you pre-configured uh, hardware systems for this. So you can call them up and say, we want to deploy security onion in our network. We have probably this much traffic in a day-to-day -day basis. And they will go, great, here is a quote for a piece of hardware and the software, here's the professional services, and we will help you get running and going with it. So that's kind of the overview of security onion, right? Very similar to everything else we've been talking about, right? All these, all these tools are so oddly similar. Who would have thought? So we'll move kind of away from the tools themselves and let's think about how we use these kinds of things, right? And what kind of data we're gathering. When you're putting one of these kinds of tools in place in your network, you need to really think about that architecture. Uh, like I mentioned, when I set up Greylog from the OVA and then went, oh, we'll just migrate this into production, that blew up on me because I did not plan out the architecture in advance. You know, you can build clusters with a lot of these things. You can really streamline your systems, but you need to be thinking about how much data you want to store, how long you want to store it, and what that's actually going to cost you. I, I mean, if the inspector general comes down and says, "Look, we want every network and firewall and you know host log, and we want to keep them for at least three years," what kind of quote are you going to have to go out and get, and then turn around to the inspector general office and say? Well, you know, can we afford this? You know, maybe we can turn this down a little bit and just grab the criticals, right? So we need to be thinking about that um, just out of the gate so we can help build and source these systems. Let's think about uh, a couple of scenarios too. One of the things that when I talk to different shops about bringing a tool like this into their environment and whether they would want to consider it or not, most shops, especially around here, were Windows, right? We're all Microsoft people. They are the ones we buy everything from. Well, we can still use this very well with all of our Windows systems. If you're not familiar with it, the SysInternals team makes a tool called Sysmon. Sysmon is a extra logging utility that installs and runs as a driver for Windows, server, and desktop systems. This thing is focused on Windows forensics. That's all it's really designed to do. You can have this thing set up to monitor all your process creations and log it all out. All of your network connections, log them out. All your file creations, log them out. And then if you're gathering those logs into a tool like you know, Security Onion or into Greylog, then you can go through and actually search and correlate all of these items in your environment. So uh, Sysmon, I'll show you. You can see that it gathers uh, and creates different categories. When you're writing an alert, you can write alerts in these tools around these different categories, so you get an idea of, you know, look, we know that this server 
should never have files created on it because it's just a web host and that's it. If somebody's creating files on it, we want to get an alert because something is weird and our baselines are changing. Well, we can set that up with Syslon real easy and it will dump it out and then we can gather that in. Most of these tools use some sort of collector. Uh, OSEC will do collection logs for you into the systems. If you're using Graylog, I believe they call it the collector sidecar. It's very similar to OSEC. It's just a basically a log hoover for your local systems. But you can set it to get the stuff in. Yes. Is it uh, agent-based then? Um, some of them, yes, you do want to run the agent. Okay. There's a couple different ways to do it. You can build your architecture out differently. If you're using something like Sysmon uh, to do logging, you can use just the native Windows logging to dump it all into one centralized server and then run the agent there instead of having to deploy the agent everywhere. But some of these tools won't take Windows logs natively. They will need some sort of agent to interpret those logs correctly so you can search. Thank you. Yep. Uh, one of the, the, the best things about Sysmon that I think is really neat is that you can set it up for every time a file hits your system, it will automatically hash that file. So you can actually track a piece of malware through your environment by that hash. And you can take that hash out and you can search it. You can see there it's created a log with hash and you can see it's infected. But if I know that hash and that alert, I can go back into my gray log or my security onion system. I can punch in that hash and I can track that malware or that attack as it walks through my environment and see exactly which hosts I'm going to have to go back to and remediate. So that's kind of a nice feature there for that one. Uh, another thing that you should be thinking about maybe, and you can hoover this stuff up, is uh, PowerShell logging, right? <laughs> Who uses PowerShell regularly? That's, that's uh, all right, that's better hands than I've seen in the past. That's good, it's growing. It's growing on us, right? Microsoft is making it grow on us, whether we want it to or not. Um, PowerShell is a fantastic scripting language. If you're not using it in your environment, you're most likely going to have to soon because Microsoft is really starting to move this way uh, and it works really well. It, it's a very simple and easy to understand language. But because it works really well, there's a few things going on with it, right? So like any tool, we can use it for good or for evil. You know, It's whether I'm using it for administration, that's great, good tool. There are entire penetration testing frameworks now built in PowerShell so that you can drop them into a Windows environment and move through that environment natively without having to use anything like Meterpreter, which will get picked up very easily. That's Empire, uh, which is super fun uh, if you haven't played with it. Uh, I was doing one the other day where I had a, a, um, a key logger written entirely in PowerShell running on a system that was sending all of the uh, logs, uh, the keystrokes back to me on my uh, attack system. Just a fun, fun thing to play with. Really give it a shot. Uh, Emotech, again, this is malware written almost exclusively in PowerShell so that in our Windows environments, it just comes in and we're cool with it, right? Well, we can be tracking that kind of information and logging it, right? So, you need to use group policy to turn it on. Um, there are group policies for Windows PowerShell, uh, and you can turn on script block logging, which will, if anybody copies and pastes an actual block of script, it will record that action for you as well as the script. Uh, and then the other thing you might want to consider is PowerShell transcription. Uh, that's for the guys actually sitting there at the keyboard and typing, right? So we can see that you know, in any any kind of environment, right? If I go in and I make a change in PowerShell to administer a system and I make a mistake and I go, I didn't do it, we can go back to those logs and be like, no, Nick, you are an idiot. You did this on Tuesday. <laughs> or we can come back into these logs and we can actually track attackers or we can build alerts around attacks built in PowerShell. But we can only do that if we've turned on our PowerShell logs and we are gathering those logs somewhere where we can search them. Uh, and that's, I think, about all I wanted to talk about. Yeah, so I'm going to turn it over to Kyle now. Oh. Well, I was really hoping you'd just kind of roll me out of that one, but uh, that's <laughs> fine, not a problem at all. Uh, hi, folks, I'm Kyle Kelly. And left and right, okay. 
Uh, so yeah, these, these are, are actually just a couple of the uh, the open source products that we were talking about: OSIM, uh, Security Onion, Graylog. Uh, these are actually just some of their their uh, I, I guess a, a clause that they actually post on each one of the websites. One product for so many uses. I believe that was actually um, Alien Vault. Go back to layers of your enterprise security onion and collect all the data, dig deeper, and identify threats ridiculously fast. As a claim uh, posted by Graylog. One of the things that I did want to state. <laughs> is uh, that I'm actually, my discussion is more on kind of a, a broad spectrum of op open source technology and not necessarily these directly toward these three products. Uh, one, one, of the, one of the statements that I would like to, uh, to point out is that open source equals software freedom, not necessarily free software. Now, a majority of these products that we're, we were talking about, they do offer free solutions. Um, there are a few that are actually, that, that you actually do have to pay for uh, OSIM, like, like we, we were talking about, there, there is their, uh, their commercial software solution uh, that, they, that they offer. OSIM is going to be the, the open source product of it. My slide is actually, for the most part, very simple. This is ultimately going to be the single slide that we're going we're gonna to talk about. And uh, the question is whether or not to use OSS, the open source software. And uh, we're, I'm just going to lightly go through some of the pros and cons. Uh, so the pros, uh, Let's see. There, are, uh, there are actually a, a lot of obvious pros in association to open source solutions. Uh, lower up, no upfront costs compared to a lot of the commercial products. Um, mostly, uh, a lot of the solutions are migrating toward uh, the cloud right now. Most of the solutions out there that are open source really require an on-premise installation uh, that require you, as was stated before in one of the other slides, uh, a VM, a virtual environment to be able to host it in, uh, bare metal to be able to install the, the software solution on. Um, if you guys have the time and availability as well as the hardware available, why not try it out? Go ahead and test them out. Uh, give yourself uh, the due diligence actually to, to, to learn the ins and outs of the product and, and, and provide a, a solid evaluation. And, uh, Sorry guys, I was uh, kind of stressed on time to, to set this up, so uh, bear with me here. Kyle also has a newborn in the mix. Oh, yeah. Congrats, man. Yeah, I appreciate it, yeah. Just, uh, just learning how to stand up at the moment, but uh, I'm trying to anyway, it's, it's hilarious. Um, uh, let's see here, so uh, kind of a counterpart to the fact that uh, there's lower no upfront costs, there's actually a long-term cost that's, that's, uh, that's associated. If something breaks, ideally it's gonna be up to you to invest your resources to fix it. There, it's not like you can reach out to a vendor and, and, and just kind of pass it off to them to, to resolve and kind of let you sit back for the most part and just kind of wait for them to resolve the ticket because there is no vendor. That's, uh, that's definitely a con in, in terms of uh, open source. Um, always make sure to consider the cost of implementation and staff training associated with introducing new solutions to your environment. Um, so I guess the question is how's the reliability? I mean, we already talked about the, the, the cost uh, perspective, but how's the reliability? Open source security technologies have constant improvements and are continuing to evolve with the help and dedication from communities of de developers and end users. Uh, developers generally have a, have a reputation upkeep and they do like to, to show off a lot of their skills. Uh, there are so many eyes involved in the communities that are going through reviewing the code that's actually submitted for a lot of these open source uh, solutions that ultimately nobody wants to get called out on any kind of mistake. So, I mean, they're going to really strive to succeed when they submit their, their code entries and, and, and they're developing these products. Uh, so, efforts put forth by numerous individuals all wanting to stake claim to their credibility provide a collective of security initiative. Uh, but sadly, again, a counterpart is that uh, there's no dedicated support. Not for, for at least, not every open source solution has uh, dedicated support. I believe Security Onion, if I'm not mistaken, just recently uh, proposed to offer support for their, their, their product. Um, 
Sorry, I'm, I'm nervous if nobody else can tell. I'm uh, super nervous up here, so my, my apologies. It's been a while since I actually uh, got, from, got from a crowd, so. Uh, even though there actually may be, so, so we were talking about the dedicated support, there is no dedicated support, but there are a lot of community tracks that are, that are supporting uh, or backing these solutions, but you're still gonna have to get your hands dirty. Trial and error becomes uh, just a common practice. Help can be found in these relevant communities, but uh, for free, but no one is really kind of obligated to help you out. I mean, it's, it's kind of based off of their time and availability. Um, so a lot of it is kind of a do-it-yourself. Um, another topic to keep in mind is the potential for uh, open source projects to, uh, to actually be, to be dropped or uh, kind of shift their direction. This may be due to developers losing interest. Uh, this may be due to dependency, uh, project dependencies no longer being available to them. Um, or just developers are kind of just uh, uh, have too much time invested in a, in a particular project and they're kind of spread out in, in terms of their availability that they can't dedicate time to a certain project. So they tend to just fall off for the most part or kind of get expressed out for uh, a number of years before it, they sort of, they're available to sort of back around to it. Uh, an example of, of kind of one of the projects, an open source project that dropped off back in 2014 is TrueCrypt. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that one. That one ended because of the dependency for Windows XP. It, the Microsoft quit supporting Windows XP. TrueCrypt was dedicated towards Windows XP. They dropped it. Ultimately, it turned into a branch, two different branches uh, when, when Vista and Windows 7 came out. Uh, so they kind of continued the project itself, but under two different project names. Under, so TrueCrypt was, was one of the, the projects that actually dropped off. Excuse me. Up to this point, it seems like uh, open source is, a, is kind of more for DIYers, but uh, with the development practice used in uh, open source uh, development, what the hell? My slide just went blank on me. Um, all right, well, that's no good to me. Uh, all right. <laughs> um, so I guess with the, with the development practice, that uh, it's, just, it's just continually growing. It's, um, I mean, we, we have so many community tracks that are, that are provided, uh, just so many people involved, dedicated uh, developers and end users just working together that they, they, these products are actually no longer, kind of, they're migrating away from being a, a DIY solution to being more of an enterprise-based solution. Uh, we were talking earlier about OSIM and how we can invest that into our environments. I mean, yes, it was actually stated, hey, do we want to use it in, in production as, as, as a front line or do we actually want to use it on the back end? Why not split the difference? Yeah, you can purchase the, the, the commercial product and actually have the support where you need it in your, on, on the front end in, in your production environment, but on the back end, dev test your uh, well, yeah, I'd say dev test, and I'll leave it there. But for the most part, your dev test, maybe your internal infrastructure, I would definitely say these products are perfect for those locations, for those, those the best scope of environments. Uh, one of the, uh, I guess a pro in terms of open source is that bug, bugs and other issues tend to be dealt with as soon as they're caught by community members. There's just so many eyes on these products that uh, just reviewing the code that it's bound to be found. Um, there, there's kind of a, a counterpart to that is in terms of uh, considering open source is, is developed in an uncontrolled environment, there's a potential that someone could ultimately inject some malicious content and it's, it's, gonna, it's bound to happen. That's not to say that it won't happen in a commercial environment or a commercial solution, but ultimately they have a more controlled environment or they have uh, uh, processes that they have to follow and in order to, uh, to kind of roll those out or weed those out for the most part. Considering there's so many eyes on the open source, again, nobody wants to get caught out on a mistake or anything of that nature. If there is something malicious that's injected, it's very, very short-lived. I mean, it's been, it's been proven that it is very, very short-lived. Uh, this could be not necessarily just the code itself being injected, but it actually could be uh, a falsified uh, download source. Thus, the reason to always go out and, and verify your checksum on your downloads. 
take your download, scan them against a, an antivirus solution or multiple antivirus solutions. Uh, protect yourself is, is, the, is the point there. Uh, another pro with open source is the freedom to modify the software in a way that suits your business needs. This it could be just an integration with some of the other products that you currently have in place um, in, in, in inside your network. Um, kind of a con here is, and I'm sure you guys have seen this all over the place, commercial or open source, developer stripe functionality prior to look and feel. I mean, it can, it can actually have some great functionality on the back end. It can do just so many things. But it's whether or not you can actually use it to that to that aspect. It's, it's I mean, it could be so confusing just to get in and try to figure out exactly how to make what you want perform that uh, you lose interest in, 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 the, in the open source project and you end up trying to look for an alternative to that open source project. So um, I guess that's pretty much all I have to, to say in terms of pros and cons. Any questions or any suggestions there? Yes, sir. Um, with the open source projects that you work with, um, do you see uh, stuff like Java dependencies uh, patched more frequently than network enterprise made software? Um, Or is that kind of still just a <laughs> shot in the dark? That one's still kind of a shot in the dark on that one. Yeah, yeah. That, that really depends on the team and who's working on it. And that's, that's right. And that's with everything with commercial and open source for that kind of stuff, is whatever dependency they've baked into or they've, they've really latched onto, you know, for some reason they really like, you know, JDK 1.4 <laughs> and you're just currently stuck yeah. with it. That's right. It's, it's the way it goes sometimes. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you. Anyone else? So, I mean, uh, number two is, is having the resources to implement this stuff as well, right? I mean, so most typical IP shops are slammed already. So, uh, and logs have been around for ages. I mean, we've had syslogers and we've had Windows to that type of thing. It's getting the time to go and analyze it. Certainly, the reports and the alerts help, but it's still very time intensive to be able to. Keep on I'm sure. Yeah, and I mean, and that's where kind of a, that, that can become a con for the most part in terms of, I mean, it's it's uh, it's going out and assessing the implementation, uh, assessing exactly where you want it, how you want it to work, and then determining whether or not you actually have the resources available to invest into that. Absolutely. I mean, ideally, the software may not cost anything. There's no license agreement or anything that uh, that you or, or license contract that you have to pay for. But uh, yeah, it's time is money. I mean, that's the point of it. Sometimes you may even have to call on an outside consultant that specializes in that product to come in, Agreed. help you do the initial setup, give you a little bit of training on it, and then tailor the product to your environment so that you don't get into that administrative overload. And then, you know, they're, they're there for like, you know, their 90 day engagement and they're gone, but you get something pretty good out of it in the end. But I think the same thing happens with commercial products. So, so. All right, guys, yeah. uh, folks, if that's uh, all the questions, I think we're good to go, and I think we're going to break for lunch. Uh, yeah, so at this time, uh, because this side of the house, everything's a bit longer and a bit more intense, uh, we want to give you guys some time to actually go out and get some food that isn't just the cookies and coffee in the back. We are actually experiencing okay weather right now, so I would recommend wandering down the street. Uh, there's Jimmy John's, Mr. Roboto's is always great. Um, there's just a ton of stuff like right down the road. Here.